Hey, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, there's a little bit of background noise, so um, if you could make sure that you are muted so that when our speaker uh, begins that we don't have um, too many distractions. So thanks for being on the call today, everybody. There's quite a few on here, so I'm really excited. Um, so my name is Christine Glover. I am the chair uh, for the InterReach webinar series. And um, today's speaker is Riley Henson from Virginia Tech. And her talk is gonna be the project manager's role in interdisciplinary research. And Riley spoke uh, at the Science of Team Science Conference this past uh, May in Lansing, Michigan. And uh, just really galvanized the room. There was tons of questions. Everybody was really, really interested in, in how, uh, how she had acquired such a position. So I'll let her go into detail about, um, about how she uh, found this role and, and what, her, uh, what her experience has been like in it. So I'm gonna go ahead and just mute everybody. Nope. Um, okay. Um, all right. So yeah. Um, and Riley is going to go into actually a little bit more detail um, about her bio. So I won't go into too much detail on that. But um, suffice it to say that very excited to have Riley uh, join us today on the October uh, edition of the Interreach webinar. So Riley, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk about this subject today and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I think I hope this is going to be really interesting. So, as we said, I'm going to be talking about the project manager's role in interdisciplinary research. I wanted to start by highlighting this little bit of text on the fabulous interreach website right here, where it describes interreach professionals as sometimes being people who are in alt academic careers with a much less established valued and visible trajectory than the traditional tenure track pathway and the reason i'm highlighting this is because it resonated with me so much um, which is not to say that i don't feel valued in my current position as a project manager but rather that it was not at all a well-established position when i sort of went into it and I often feel like I'm sort of in the same spaces as professors, as researchers, as graduate students, postdocs, but I don't ever see other individuals who are project managers, who are other interreach professionals in those spaces. And so I would definitely say it's a less visible trajectory, at least in the disciplines where I'm working primarily. And of course, this all changed when I went to my first uh, Science of Teen Science conference this year, which was uh, really sort of uh, groundbreaking for me to be with all these other uh, people who are sort of doing, doing similar things and researching in similar ways. So that just sort of sets a little bit of context for how I'm approaching this. The goals that I want to accomplish during today's webinar are first to give an example of what an interreach career can look like. And by that, I basically just mean sort of share with you my career history almost as a case study. I'll then share some project management lessons with you from academia. And of course, if you read the little abstract that was sent out, you'll see, you would have seen that I am indeed, you know, like self-identified as an early career uh, professional. I don't have all the answers. I can't share with you like the, the ultimate most insightful lessons from project management in academia and in interdisciplinary research, but I would be happy to share with you what I've learned so far on my career path. And then finally, I'd like us to explore the role of project managers in research more broadly. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that I see myself and potentially others coming up against, but that's also a place where I think that some of you in the audience today will probably have some really interesting things to contribute. So if we have time, I'm hoping to open it up so that we can hear about other people's experiences as well. So first off, my career path as a case study. I'm gonna start at the very beginning of my career. Basically, since childhood, I have had a love for animals, love for nature, and particularly birds. And so over the years, that love of birds sort of evolved into an interest in conservation biology. Um, birds are often used as sort of flagship species 
uh, for conservation. And that's sort of how I realized that this was something I was passionate about. You've got to protect the birds. And that led me to pursue a major in biology when I went to my undergraduate university, which was the College of William and Mary. So I was pursuing biology because it just sort of seemed like the next logical step, given my interest in animals and conservation. But then partway through, I discovered, I discovered sociology as a field when I was required to take a, a course in it. And then I ended up minoring in sociology because I found that it was sort of this missing piece, uh, at least in my head, for, you know, making the results of biological or natural sciences research um, useful and uh, applicable to real people's um, behaviors, decision making, that kind of thing. And that's going to be a recurring theme in my career. Uh, so during this time in undergrad, I was also doing ecology research. I was studying um, interactions of insect species, uh, pollinator species, with milkweed plants. And so that was a really cool experience to be able to do that undergrad research. It was my first experience of what it was like to do research. And uh, it sort of led me to understand that um, there were certain ways in which my interests and skill sets aligned with research and others in which that sort of prevented me from necessarily seeing myself as becoming a PI in my career. So that experience, led me to apply to a master's program, the Master of, master of Environmental Management program at Duke University at the Nick School of the Environment. And the reason that this was the one that caught my eye was because it's kind of a non-traditional master's program. And so it doesn't have a thesis, but rather it has a master's project which is focused on a lot of times applied research. And in my case, it was collaborative uh, client-based research. So this is often referred to as a terminal master's program where most of the people who uh, enroll and graduate, they don't go on to pursue a PhD afterwards. Some people do, but most people just go out into the field. They go out into industry. This is the education that they need to sort of move forward in a more applied sense. So this is a really inter interdisciplinary program and I made sure that I took an interdisciplinary track within it. I ended up focusing on environmental educa education and outreach because this seemed like the perfect intersection of um, sociology, psychology, all those good social sciences, and the environment, the natural sciences. It's sort of where the two can meet and you know one can flow into the other. And so that was something that I found, I sort of discovered that I was really interested in and passionate about education and outreach during this time. After I graduated with my master's, I ended up moving to Blacksburg, Virginia. And if you're not familiar with Blacksburg, it's where Virginia Tech is located. And that's one of Virginia's biggest, um, most well-known universities. Um, but most people haven't heard of Blacksburg. Many people have heard of Tech. Most people don't know where Blacksburg is. But so I moved there and I was seeking a job in environmental communications at the time. I applied to uh, positions all around the location geographically, but most of those were centered in the university, of course. And so that is how I ended up coming across the position that I have now, where I am a project manager at Virginia Tech, and I am working in the Department of Forest Resources and Environmental Conservation. And so I, um, I'm working on primarily one specific research project. So I don't manage projects for the entire department. I manage basically just one particular research project. My position is funded by that particular research project. And then I also sort of dabble in other uh, projects as they come up, just however I can be helpful to uh, my supervisor and, and our colleagues. I wanna go a little bit into the job description for this position because I think, I think it's really interesting um, to sort of see the day-to-day -day nitty gritty of what this job is like. The first thing I want to point out is that it was not a job listing for project manager. It was a job listing for project technician. And I believe that the reason for that is just because they didn't really, the university didn't have a formalized project manager role in the context of research within a department. I'm sure that the university has project managers that they hire for administration and in various different offices, 
but not in the context of a research project like this. So I applied to be a project technician and it was only sort of after I had been in the job for a week or so that my, uh, my supervisor came to me and said, you know, we, we've really been thinking of you as a project manager. You know, if you want to put project management on your business cards, that's certainly what we consider you. So I think that's an interesting thing to, uh, to point out. So some of the things that I was uh, asked to do, work with a diverse research team that spans several academic disciplines and institutions, coordinate research tasks and activities in order to meet overarching project objectives, organize project logistics, including teleconferences and workshops, administer and update project management software to track team activities, maintain and populate project website with research project products, compile annual project report. And that was actually the first task that I ever really did when I first got this job. I was sort of put in charge of doing this annual report to our funding organization. And that was a really great introduction because it allowed me to go back and read previous project reports, uh, read the project proposal itself. I got to sort of use that as an avenue to meet all of the different project personnel and ask them what they've been up to. And then finally, support team researchers by assisting with literature reviews, editing, and data management, particularly in the disciplines of economics and or natural resource management. And I think that's an interesting thing to point out too, is that my, my direct supervisor, she's in the Department of Forest Resources and Environmental Con Conservation, uh, but she's an economist, so she's a natural resource economist. So that's one way in which this, the, the team is super interdis interdisciplinary and everything's all sort of melded together in an interesting way. But there are also other things that I work on. Um, that job description that I just showed you is actually, it's held up really well. Um, it's not one of those situations where my position has totally shifted. Uh, all of the things that I just listed are things that I have been doing and still am doing, but there is other stuff as well. And this has been, uh, I've been really lucky in, my res in this respect because my supervisor is um, really sensitive to the needs of early career folks and sort of um, has given me the opportunity to um, take a look at like what are my interests what are my professional development goals and how can I work those into the project so that I'm doing things that benefit both my own career and the research project and the research team and some ways that we've been able to do that I've been helping out writing manuscripts and in fact I am uh, leading a manuscript right now that touches on uh, some of the things that I'm going to mention in this presentation, it focuses on our team's experience with managing a large interdisciplinary team, uh, the techniques that have worked for us. So stay tuned for that. We're hoping to uh, submit before too much longer. I also help to manage the social media and the website for the project. Um, this is something that I just sort of, um, I had done before. I had experience with this in my career and it sort of seemed like the, great, uh, the right fit. This is my favorite thing that I get to do, I think. I get to create graphics and videos. Um, I enjoy it because it's creative, but it's also, I just have fun using those kinds of tools. Um, so I, for instance, might create graphics that show the project workflow or the project sort of um, conceptual diagram. I create graphics that might go on our website or they might go into presentations or papers. And I also spend some time uh, recording and editing video uh, which is another just sort of like personal interest of mine. And I, um, those were videos that we used sort of to communicate our research objectives and share information about our project and to get sort of people hyped up about why our project was new and interesting. And so those are all available on our website, but they're also, um, you know, we used them on social media and things like that. And then finally, I help with um, surveys sometimes I do just a little bit of everything whenever people uh, need assistance on something I've like sort of dabbled in um, keeping uh, our project documentation organized metadata that kind of stuff um, it's I'm, I've learned a lot about a lot of different things um, but this is an area where I've sort of am able to uh, employ some of the stuff that I learned in grad school um, on this project even though it's not my main focus So moving on to our second goal, what is it like to manage the large interdisciplinary team of the CNH Lakes project? So the project that I keep referring to, we call it CNH Lakes. The CNH stands for Coupled Natural and Human Systems, and the abbreviation actually is derived from the 
National Science Foundation uh, program that funds our research. So this picture here at the bottom, you can see is sort of a snapshot of our team. This is not the entire team, but rather just everybody who was able to make it to this year's project workshop. We represent a lot of different uh, institutions and universities. Uh, we're sort of centered at Virginia Tech because the lead PIs are all at Virginia Tech and we have a fair proportion of the team members here, but we also have a lot of crucial people at all kinds of other different places. And as you can see, we can also, we also represent a lot of different uh, disciplines, economics, ecology, hydrology, sociology, agronomy, as well as other, other ones um, like earth sciences, all kinds of different stuff, data science, uh, the list goes on. So why do we need so many disciplines to be represented on the project? Well, it comes down to our research objectives. And those are summarized by this diagram where you can see there are two arrows that are sort of connected in a type of feedback loop. And there's one arrow representing uh, humans and one that represents freshwater lakes. So each of these points around the feedback loop represents a way that the two, uh, the two can interact with each other and feedbacks can be propagated throughout the system. So, you know, for instance, if human communities decide to use their land in a certain way, then those land uses are going to influence the hydrology of the watershed, which will influence the quality of water in the lake, which, you know, maybe it will reduce in there being, or it will result in there be, being a reduced number of fish available to uh, fisher people, or maybe the water quality is not good enough to go swimming um, or boating, uh, maybe tourism is affected, that kind of thing. And so that can, again, feed back into collective action. People might pass different regulations, change their behavior, and it goes on uh, pretty much forever. So basically the way that we tackle this is that we have a disciplinary model or a dis dis discipline specific model for each of these different points around the feedback loop. And then for the quantitative models, which are the majority of them, um, we basically take one model's outputs and use them as inputs to the next model. So for instance, we might take the outputs of our economic um, decision-making model that say, you know, here's how much farmers would plant to corn this year. We can take those outputs and feed them into our agronomic model, which will then say, here's how much nitrogen or phosphorus was leached into the soil after that growing season. Then we also have qualitative anal analyses. Um, so we did some qualitative analysis of the lake associations, which are civic organizations that form around certain lakes. Um, that qualitative analysis is used to bound and contextualize the scenarios that we run by our, run through our other models. And so it sort of um, provides a much deeper and richer perspective on how all of this fits together. So we're fitting together all of these different uh, disparate analyses. And as you can imagine, that kind of thing requires a lot of careful communication between the disciplines. Um, so the way that we approach that, first and foremost, we have our annual in-person workshops. I've only been to two of these because I joined partway through the project. There were two that took place before I came on. And um, these are absolutely critical for in ensuring that everybody on the team has a shared vision of the research goals, the research questions, and making sure everyone's on the same page. It's also a really great opportunity to um, sort of explore what kind of capacity we have, what skills do the different team members have, what connections do they have, um, what are we going to be able to do with what we have. So annual in-person workshops are like the sort of almost the bedrock, I would say. Um, I don't know if my team members would necessarily agree, but we always leave those, I think, feeling like uh, we've got a lot done and that we're sort of um, a lot more on the same page than we were before. But of course, annual is not often enough for a team like this to meet. So we also have monthly video conferences. Um, during those, we generally just, you know, we provide time for general project news, upcoming events, administrative items, but we also uh, just have every disciplinary modeling team come and uh, give a quick update on what they've been working on, what they are uh, gonna be working on in the future. Uh, this is also a great chance for people to uh, connect with each other if they're having issues. You know, if one team is having a, uh, they've encountered a challenge in coupling their model to the next team, 
from the next model, then they can use these video conferences as an opportunity to um, let everybody know what, the, what challenge they've encountered and figure out who there can help them and get everybody connected and um, set up a plan for how to move forward. And then, of course, we have some ad hoc in-person meetings. These are much easier for people who are at the same institution as each other, which does sometimes happen. Um, but there are also occasions when um, team members at different institutions will be working on a particular coupling of models and they'll run into issues or they'll have these big questions that they need to answer. And if, if it turns out that video conferences and emails just aren't cutting it, in-person meetings, despite the fact that you have to, you know, deal with the travel and it's not convenient and it's not always cheap, they are almost always significantly more efficient, more effective. Everybody is able to um, get their problems solved, their questions answered uh, a lot more effectively than trying to communicate remotely. So one of our big recommendations is just to always, you know, if you have the resources, then always be open to in-person meetings when possible. I also wanted to talk a little bit about adaptability because with a team like ours, it's a fairly large team um, over the course of a number of years. So people are going to join and leave the team. People have joined and left uh, the CNH Lakes project. A lot of that is because, you know, maybe they're graduate students and they graduated. Or maybe a new person joins uh, one of the PI's labs and that person is really interested in this topic, so we bring them on so that they contribute. To, the, uh, to a certain new kind of analysis. And this can uh, sort of, um, it can be a challenge at some times to figure out, you know, how can we document people's work such that when they leave, we won't have a big drop in efficiency, or how can we onboard people in an effective way so that they learn all of the complicated stuff that's going on on the project in a way that's not overwhelming, but does allow them to integrate and start working as quickly as possible. One thing that we found is that you really need to be willing to adapt your research questions to fit the resources that you have available to you. So, you know, your, the data that are available to you may change um, the expertise that's represented by the people on the team and the time that people have to contribute to different analyses. That can change and you just, it's important to not consider it a failure of your project if one of the questions you established at the outset doesn't get answered because usually you know maybe you're not able to do a certain type of analysis but generally speaking another door is going to open where that one closed research is unpredictable i think most of us would agree i wanted to touch on managing up as well and managing up is an interesting concept that to be honest was new to me when I started preparing for this uh, presentation, but I think it's interesting to talk about it. My impression is that it generally describes um, the practice of being proactive with regard to interacting with your supervisors, your bosses, um, you know, sort of managing that relationship so that everything runs smoothly. And I'm going to talk about it here in the context of all the different PIs on my project. So sort of uh, me managing up to all the researchers. Um, and so forgive me if that it doesn't quite fit the uh, official definition of managing up, but I'm still working on it. Um, so one thing that comes to mind when I think about this kind of concept is tailoring communications. There are people on the team, you know, we're all individuals. We all have different preferences, work styles, communication styles. Uh, I find that some people on the team are super quick to respond to group emails. Other people will only respond to an email if it's addressed to them specifically, only to them. Some people are really best to talk to if you can just drop by their office or if you can set up a video call and get all your information out at once. So, you know, if a PI or a researcher is taking on all of these project management tasks, it's a lot less likely that they're going to have the time and energy to tailor each communication uh, to each different person. But because my role is sort of dedicated to that kind of thing, I do have the time and energy to get to know everybody on the team, get to know how they like to work, 
and tailor the communications so that everybody's happy, everybody's getting all the information that they need. We're getting, you know, we sort of the project administration are getting the information we need from them. Taking initiative is also important because I work on a team of professors and grad students who are all the time going out of town on conferences, teaching classes, um, you know, professors will have to go, you know, for a uh, committee meeting. It's crazy busy. And the project may not be something that you would necessarily describe as fast paced, but I would say that most uh, academics consider their schedules probably to be pretty fast paced. And so for me as the project manager, taking initiative to um, work on anything I can while people are busy to make sure that they come back to a project that is well organized and not sort of overflowing with news and updates. Um, that's been something important in, uh, in that I found in my current role. And then also finding ways to use and develop your own skills that you bring that are maybe um, skills that no one else on the team has or skills that no one else on the team has time to employ. Uh, so I, I talked a little bit about how I get to um, choose some of the things that I get to work on on this project and that's uh, that's a lot you know related to this in regards to you know maybe you're really good at graphic design and there's no one else on the team who wants to take care of the website so you take care of the website or maybe you're really good at data analysis or um, you know data management uh, and that may not have been in your job description but you come on the team and it, if it fits then you can become that person for the team in addition to the other stuff that you are uh, taking on. So I'd like to move into the third and final uh, sort of section of this presentation, which has to do with the role of project managers in research and perhaps interdisciplinary research more broadly. So when should project managers have a more formalized role in this context? I guess I'll start by saying that I recognize that there are disciplines out there where project management is more formalized than it is in uh, my current position and my discipline. I have a feeling that in um, medical fields, it's probably a lot more formalized, sometimes um, computer science, that kind of thing. Um, I would be interested to hear at the end if anyone in the audience has experience with this. I think that's a really interesting thing to explore. But in my particular field, which is you know environmental conservation, uh, conservation biology, there's not a whole lot of formalization, as you saw with my role, um, for project managers. So a lot of times project management tasks, like tracking the budget, tracking progress, facilitating meetings, making sure everyone's on track, enforcing deadlines, a lot of that falls to the PIs. Uh, the researchers, the professors, they may delegate it to grad students and postdocs. And so I found, especially in my research for the manuscript that I mentioned earlier, a lot of project management resources that are specific to the sciences are focused and geared towards those PIs as opposed to people who are literally project managers in the sciences. Um, so that's been uh, an interesting discovery and you know sometimes it can be a, it can be tough if you're looking for um, advice on how to do something and it, it's just not really out there or at least it's difficult to find. So the project manager can have different roles on a research project. And when we talk about interdisciplinary projects specifically, I think the, the project manager can be this go-between person, this person who translates the needs of one discipline to another, um, you know, almost like the hub. Um, so you know how you have one discipline, it's got its own jargon, its own understanding of the way science is done. You can have another discipline that is completely opposite. It's, they, they have a really hard time uh, using the same vocabulary and, um, and, and that's something that you can build over time. But you can also have a person whose job it is to um, sort of listen to one discipline's needs, listen to their, um, the, the things that they're working on and the things that they need from the other team, and then go to the other team and say, this is what's going on. Um, this, is, uh, this is how we should move forward and sort of um, be that person. I wouldn't say that that's been a huge component of what I do in my current role because a lot of the folks on this project have worked together before. A lot of them already sort of have established patterns for how to interact on these kinds of things. Uh, so 
this is just sort of one way that the project manager might fill that role. You know, there, there may be other roles or um, other positions that could fill that role as well. Um, but this is something that we can talk about a little bit more later too, if we're interested. I've found though that it's difficult to learn enough about each discipline. I think that a really experienced and very, very good facilitator or project manager would be able to do these kinds of things without knowing about each of the individual disciplines. I think that there is that level where you can sort of do this based on active listening, based on um, you know, sort of asking questions when you need to. I have found that it's easier for me to try to educate myself sort of on my own individually about the different models that are being used and the different disciplines so that I have a more solid foundation for understanding the conversations that are going on around me in the project. But it's also been a challenge because it's a lot of disciplines, it's a lot of models. I, I can't really become an expert in all of them. And so I've, I've been working to find that balance in my current role. Why fund a project manager? This is something that I wanted to talk about because it's, um, you know, it's on people's minds when they're, when they're talking about, should we hire a project manager? Um, and, and I will be, to be clear, not every research project necessarily would benefit from a project manager, someone who that's their dedicated role. Every project needs to be managed, but it doesn't always necessarily need a project manager specifically, depending on the size, the scope, that kind of thing, the funding. But, it can also be really helpful, as we found on my particular project, and as I'm sure other people have found as well. And that's because the project manager is often going to be bringing a specialized skill set in terms of managing communications, uh, facilitating meetings and facilitating discussions, um, tracking budget, tracking timelines, using software that's designed for project management. These are all things that can be done by the PIs and can be done by grad students and postdocs, but probably not all at the same time by the same person and with the same quality and uh, I guess confidence with the same experience. Project managers are going to be generally um, trained in these kinds of things. A project manager is also able to take administrative pressure off of the researchers. Um, there are a lot of things that I do in my job that I think that before I was brought on, uh, PIs were having to take care of it and I don't know how they found the time. I, I guess that's why they decided they needed a project manager. <laughs> um, it's, you know, these, all these kinds of administrative things, especially in universities, where the administration is often really complex, confusing, demands a lot, a lot of documentation, that kind of thing. It's really helpful to have one person whose role is dedicated to that so that the researchers can focus on the research. And then finally, I think it's really important to have one person who is dedicated to sort of taking that bird's eye view of the project to make sure that we're on track and on schedule. Because for the researchers who are every day, you know, in the nitty gritty um, doing the research tasks, it can be hard to remind yourself Take a step back, say, you know, are we gonna meet our quarterly goals? Are we gonna meet our annual goals? Um, and so having one person, the project manager, who is dedicated to doing that makes it a lot easier to um, make sure that you don't forget about deadlines and things like that. So this final slide here, I'm going to pose some questions and I'm gonna read them all and explain them all to you and then I'll, I'll go on a little bit but this is a slide that we can return to if we have time and if people are interested in discussing these things. Um, the first question I have is, should a project manager who's working in research or working in the sciences, should they have a background in science? The reason I ask that is because I have a background in science, um, both natural sciences and social sciences. I have seen how it has been helpful for me in my current role, but I have also seen how there are certain times when I wish I had more of a project management background. Um, you know, there are certain times where I wish I had more formalized training in that as opposed to just biology and sociology and, and so on and so forth. My second question is, is it appropriate for a project manager to have a sort of catch-all role on a project? I don't know that I would necessarily define, describe my position currently as a catch-all role, 
um, because I'm not just, I'm, you know, I'm not the intern there just sort of doing everybody's tasks that they don't want to do. Um, but there are times when it's like, you know, maybe I can take on this task because it looks like people are stressed and they don't have time or that kind of thing. And so I could easily see how a project manager in this research academic institution environment might end up with sort of a catch-all role. And is that okay? When is it okay? How do you draw the line? And then how does career advancement work for project managers in an interdisciplinary context? Uh, and this is, you know, I, I'm a project manager who's funded by this particular research project. When that project is over, I got to move on. And so, you know, it, there's no se clear sequential um, set of career progressions um, that I can go through where I go from project manager on one project to another project to another project where each one has increasingly intensive roles. Um, it's just, uh, I suppose if you were really lucky, you might be able to do that, but it's not, um, it's not formalized in that way. So if, if you're a project manager in research and your role is not formalized, where do you go from there? So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to leave it on this slide for a moment so you can uh, check out this information if it's helpful to you. And I would like to open it up first to any questions that you all might have for me. Riley, thanks so much for this adept analysis of project management within the context of interdisciplinary research. Um, just as a reminder, we're recording this webinar. So um, if anyone wants to share this video with, with anyone that, um, that they think would, be, uh, would benefit from it, we'll be providing a link to the video on the InterReach website. So, and then I will just open it back up to uh, other questions. Um, and also, if anyone wants to comment on Riley's um, really, really, um, appointed questions. I think those are really great conversation starters. Thank you, Riley. Thank you. I'll give it a minute of awkward silence because I know it sometimes takes a while for people to formulate questions. It definitely does for me. I think that's always right. So Riley, this is Christine Hendren. Thanks so much. Uh, so much of what you talked about really resonated with me personally from um, roles that I have uh, seen. And I know Virginia Tech to be a, a place, they're one of our partners in the center that I was executive director for the past seven years, um, which is Center for the Environmental Implications of Nanotechnology. And my sense from our partners at Virginia Tech is that there is more than your average um, kind of support and acknowledgement for the type of role and institutional scaffolding that is needed to support projects. So to your point about um, exactly this problem or uh, limitation of uh, attracting talented people who can say, hey, this is what I'm good at and I want to do this work, but I just don't want to accrue 100% of the risk of the fact that there's not an established career trajectory. Have you seen models at Virginia Tech is what first I thought of, but anywhere of places where um, you would point to the kind of sustained support of project management or the mentoring um, that you would think could be copied? Or is it the case that you have not ever seen anywhere a uh, place that this seems kind of sustainable and real? That is a really important question. And I'm afraid it's not one that I can speak to very well. And I think the reason for that is because First of all, I'm, I'm fairly new to the project management game myself. Um, and also my role within Virginia Tech, is, because it's this one particular research project, I don't get to see a lot of what is going on elsewhere um, in terms of what the structure of the projects look like and that kind of thing. So I, um, I would be interested as well to know, you know, are there other models happening at Virginia Tech? I could completely see that being the case, that there are other ways that it's done at Virginia Tech. But I'm afraid I just don't have any examples that I can draw upon from my own personal knowledge 
to answer that question. Um, I would love to open it up in case other people have, uh, have comments on that as well. While we're seeing if anybody else jumps in, I just want to say that that answer in itself is really illuminating, right? Because it, it speaks to the point that you said about not necessarily having peers that which is the reason we formed Interreach, actually, where we look around and say, okay, I don't have colleagues that I could be in a community of practice with, that we recognize, oh, this is, we're the arrow, we're being the arrow, the glue, you know, doing this knowledge synthesis, um, or we're being marginalized somewhat by people saying, oh, great, you're organizing meetings for us, or, you know, thank you for doing uh, important administrative work, but kind of failing to acknowledge the knowledge co-production role that synthesizing and sitting in your role is. So the fact that you don't have visibility to that is an answer that is informative in itself. One question um, we could kind of pose to the group because uh, we have a lot of folks who are participating this time and um, this is a because we have such a variety of different topics we cover in interreach in both um, developing the profession making the case that we are a thing and then professional development helping each other be good at that thing um, you know th there's a wide variety of people who listen in and often I'm a fly on the wall um, kind of listening I wonder if anyone would be willing to share if there's a perfect uh, or a, a particular part of um, Riley's presentation that really hit home and you said that um, resonates with me. I definitely have this issue in my role. Okay. Um, so if nobody is kind of identifying with those specific types of, uh, of kind of uh, questions that Riley's posing here, um, does anybody have in their organization, I mean, I guess you can kind of, I don't see a place where you can raise your hand in this, but are, are there people who think to themselves, um, I do the exact same thing, or I can point to the person who is the Riley in my team. Yeah, this is Jerry Nicolai in Lyon, France. Um, I can say that we've, <clears throat> we've recognized, and I actually, we, we ran a little study with a colleague of mine from Grand Valley State University, um, where we went around and talked to people at the school that I'm at, the, the Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon, uh, that were kind of uh, firemen kind of people that were on projects that were considered very useful people, but were very difficult to define in terms of the roles that they did. We came to we came to call the group the Island of Misfit Toys. I mean, <laughs> no knew what they were doing, but they were considered vital by everyone that was working with them. Uh, and I was so uh, uh, Christine. I'm sure you you know Christine Lund. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, in Lyon, uh, who who pointed out the science of team science was just coming online, <clears throat> and I started reading what you have available, and we found you know the interdisciplinary executive scientist framework really really useful to begin um, advocating with, notably the CNRS, the French National Lab System, that this kind of profile, this kind of function, is useful pinning it to a level in terms of diploma and trying to say this is something that we should really be studying in terms of creating this kind of function formally because informally it exists and people who are in that function are basically being treated fairly badly in terms of career advancement. I mean, the difference between, between what's happening here and what's, what uh, has been described in the seminar is that we are working with fully tenured hard money staff but who are working in a in a in a in a, a, a portfolio of act a portfolio of missions that doesn't correspond to anything in their professional grills 
And so it becomes very difficult to evaluate them. It becomes very difficult to promote them. And it becomes difficult to hire someone specifically for that. So we, you know, we actually started studying the introduction of the inter, inter, uh, disciplinary executive science uh, scientist profile to the CNRS as a means of being able to say we should recruit on this kind of profile to work to to be a project runner, for very large projects. Project runner in the same sense is a is a show runner in a TV series, mm-hmm. uh, where you know they're not they're not in charge of the project, but they are a very vital part of keeping the project moving forward. So I do definitely the seminar today that resonated. There are lots of points in the seminar that, that resonated with what, what we're looking at here. That is really interesting and good to hear. Yeah, that's fascinating. And something that occurred to me while, while you were talking is that I have, um, I've attended a number of conferences as part of this project where I've presented posters and oral presentations on the research that's being done. And I found that it can be a little awkward because I don't run into other project managers there and I'm not the person who's doing the research. And so, um, you know, I always have to preface it with, you know, you may have questions about this that I can't answer. Um, And I've never found, I've never found in any way that people have made me feel unwelcome at conferences. And I'm talking about conferences like Ecological Society of America, you know, natural sciences conferences for the most part. Um, you know, people have always made me feel welcome, but it, there's something a little bit, um, just a little bit demoralizing about not ever seeing anyone else there who's in your in the same role or doing the same kind of thing. Um, so not, no one else who can share the label, I guess. I had a I had a similar experience. Um, so one thing is uh, people who work on science outreach. You know, you did your master's in in an outreach thing. There's a similar problem is that, you know, I, I am a chemist by, by uh, training. Um, and when you go to a giant international chemistry meeting, somewhere off in the second sub-basement of the secondary hotel, you're going to find a group of people who are working on outreach and have lots of things to say to each other. Uh, and those spaces are very valuable, but your chemists talking to other chemists. I mean, it's contextualized because there's no or I wasn't able to identify the, you know, national organization of people working on outreach. And in working on this international interdisciplinary executive scientist idea, I was fortunate in that there were two communities that were identified and were active. There's the science team science group, and then there's the NORDP, the National Organization of Research Development Professionals. And I went to the NORDP conference, was the first conference where I did, where you know, every seminar started with the alt academic career tra- tra- trajectory that you started yours with, and it's kind. Of, it, it's a little bit like an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. I mean, hi, I'm Jerry, and I'm a I'm a research project developer, right? Uh, and it, those, but those spaces are very, very important. I mean, in terms of what we're doing in Lyon, we're trying to cover those two conferences now. So <clears throat> Chris and another colleague are going to Science of Teen Science. I'm planning on, on following the NeuroDP conferences. And I think that, you know, one is more maybe theorizing the, the, the field and the other is maybe a little bit more practical uh, in nuts and bolts kind of meeting. I think both are very, very interesting. It's very, very interesting to, to meet the other misfit toys. You know? yeah. I'm going to have to run, so I'm not going to be able to participate in the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much for your talk. Yeah, thank you for sharing what you have. Thank yeah. you for the organization of Interreach. I continue to find them fascinating. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, super. So it's me. I'm Sabine Hoffman from EAVA, the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology. Thanks for your presentation, which really resonates with me and my position I have at EAVA. And I would like to come back to the point you made con- concerning visibility. I think it's crucial to think of building or nurturing a community of practice within Virginia Tech, within your, within your research um, university, because we did this or I did this within this AIRVAC. So I identified at a certain point people who are project managers or who are working at the interface between research policy practice and who have in their job description 
um, their particular role is facilitating processes to ensure exchange at, this, at that interface between research policy and practice. And this was crucial because um, this community of practice of people, we are around 15 people that we identified who have somehow a similar position than I have. And um, they meet two or three, we meet two or three times a year. And it gives us a visibility vis-a-vis -vis within the Institute. So it's like you may said, it's somehow managing in or managing up um, our own position and what we did also is to make our work more visible and to identify somehow indicators that could allow us to measure or to assess what we are really doing and what is our particular contribution at the interface between research policy and practice and I think this was crucial to yeah to give us a little bit more visibility and to be seen also by other by the different departments that are within AIVAC but also the directorate at AIVAC. So I think identifying people who have a similar position within your university, I think this is key. And then trying to group these people and to allow an exchange and to learn from each other and also with the idea to professionalize yourself in what you are doing. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. That is a really, um, a really useful model to be able to look at and see, uh, see how other people are doing that. I uh, maybe I should look into doing that. I should uh, start our own little interreg at Virginia Tech. Yeah, that would be a fascinating thing to do because again, it's like I, I have the sense that there probably are other people in similar roles to mine at Virginia Tech, but. I, um, it's tough to know where they are and it's a little tough to find them, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's helpful at all to just use the interreach name and logo and say we're starting a local chapter, as, I mean, I'm always fascinated by, fascinated by linguistics and Chris Lund is in linguistics as, um, you know, we were hearing about earlier. It's, it kind of acts as a lightning rod to bring people together and there's already writing around it so if people want to do that in your local places if it's useful at all to have interreach be this little nucleation tool um, feel free to do that use the logo say you're representing the group and then also if you want to um, have a little portal or you know virginia tech specific Virginia Tech chapter resources or something on our resources page, if that is a useful place. Um, this really is supposed to be just a community resource that's what we make it. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, we will welcome you to the, the DIY Squarespace method that we do in our living rooms um, for this low lift. It's just, um, it's very informal kind of by design both because we don't have time to administrate more formally, but also because we don't want there to be any barrier to co-leading and co-producing stuff with this. That's wonderful. That's, that's a fantastic suggestion too. But I also wondering if, um, uh, in terms of trying to find other folks uh, near, uh, Virginia Tech and maybe broader uh, in Blacksburg, Southwest Virginia. Um, I'm thinking about the um, North Carolina uh, has a, a project management institute chapter. Um, and so I'm wondering if uh, Virginia has that. And then also, um, are there communities of practice within that PMI um, that might be a way to sort of yeah, uh, uh, identify other folks that um, maybe are doing project management work and then are there, uh, are they doing it at Virginia Tech or at least within the context of higher education or, or academic research? That's a really good point. I, um, I have been at various times a little bit plugged into PMI um, and uh, I, I, I get emails from the Virginia um, Southwest chapter, I believe it is. Um, I have found that PMI is a little bit intimidating as a person who doesn't have a whole lot of background in project management, but I think that's such a fantastic point and that's such a good networking resource. I, um, I sometimes find myself feeling like, oh, I'm not 
you know, a project manager, project manager. I'm like a, I'm an academic project manager um, because I do think there are very real differences in the project management that goes on with, within a research project within an institution. And, you know, someone say who's working in industry or who's working in tech, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, I, I think that those, those barriers may be a little bit, um, a little bit self-imposed. Um, I think that uh, that's a good avenue that I should look into where, uh, who, who all is involved in this uh, local PMI chapter. Yeah, especially because um, I know that uh, within this, um, the CTSI, which is uh, the Clinical and Translational Science Award, which is a, a large NIH funded um, center grant that, um, I think there are maybe 60 plus uh, hubs around the country and, and Duke has one of those hubs. And so my role um, is situated within that um, institution. And so, but we have a bunch of project managers that work in the sort of clinical and translational um, realm of, of uh, research projects. And so uh, I've got to imagine that there's uh, things like that um, and maybe, maybe I'm just assuming that what I have, everybody else has. So, um, but it could be a good place to at least, uh, plug in with other folks that are doing project management in, uh, in this particular context so that there's a certain amount of like convincing yourself that you're doing a thing that's, um, that's worthy of calling yourself a project manager. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. This um, makes me think, uh, of course, we're constantly thinking of ways to plug um, the Science of Teen Science 2020 meeting, which we have the honor of uh, hosting here at Duke at June 1st through 4th of 2020. And one possible idea for a workshop submittal from people who have this kind of project management um, in a research environment uh, angle, could be to think of what would be a useful list of best practices that we'd like to flesh out. What would be useful topics that you would want to have um, a message board or a set of resources to ask about how to do things. And I think of Steve Crowley's way of describing what we are as a community in the science of team science it, by saying, you know, that um, teaming in a knowledge co-production and research environment context is different from teaming, teaming in a task-based context. And I think that that kind of uh, carries over to what you're saying in project management. So in what ways is it unique? What sort of unique nimbleness and flexibilities do you have to have as a project manager? What kind of personnel management that you touched on a lot in your talk today? Um, so just a, a thought to consider various ways that you all think um, it might be useful to use our time to co-produce something and, and come away from the sites meeting with actionable, useful resources we create together. I think this is an excellent idea. It's again me, Sabine from EAVAC, because <clears throat> there was the International Transdisciplinary Conference in Göteborg in September, and there we organized a first workshop which we called is there a new profession of integration experts on the rise so it's not the um, how you phrase it the interdisciplinary executive scientists but you phrase it somehow differently but um this was co-organized by julie thompson klein christian cole cynthia mitchell Gina Pham, chris lund and also head audrey and we said that it would be nice to organize a follow-up workshop at the science of team science conference in duke university so this would be great and there within this uh, workshop it was a two-hour workshop we discussed a little bit what are the skills the competencies and the capabilities of these kind of persons who have this integration or project manager role however you will call it and what are institutional but also individual challenges these people face and what are the roles and different resp responsibilities these people assume so i think it would be nice um, to make a follow-up and to think about a workshop together wonderful yeah awesome 
Okay. Well, again, I want to thank Riley for this really phenomenal talk um, and for uh, seeding all this really great conversation. So um, thank you everybody for joining in. Here's uh, Riley's um, uh, contact information if you'd like to connect with her. And then um, we will be posting this uh, recorded version of the webinar on the InterReach website. It'll be interreach.org backslash webinars. And uh, that'll be about uh, a week from today. Um, and then please join us again for the November uh, webinar, which will be, again, they're always on the uh, second Tuesday of the month and from noon to one Eastern time. So thanks everybody. And thank you, Riley. Thank you so much. Bye.